Follow us on YouTube by searching Duncan Bill's First Baptist Church. Make sure to like, don't forget to subscribe, and as well, click the notification bell so you'll never miss one of our videos. Somebody said that COVID-19 is going to be the crisis that will define this generation. In a similar way as uh, the builder generation was, was defined by the Great Depression, or like many of us remember, the place and the circumstances around 9-11, wherever we were at that moment, millennials and Generation Z will remember the outcome of the great pandemic. We'll remember when uh, businesses closed down. We'll remember where sc when school was canceled. We'll remember the shocking results of this pandemic. And uh, we are halfway through a whole month of shelter in place. And uh, we can see that there are more things to come. People are losing their jobs. People are getting sick. People are dying. But you know, in the midst of all this devastation and this great challenge, I believe that God is also moving the hearts of people because great challenge will bring great opportunity. Opportunity to, for people of faith to rise up and to be a blessing to their communities. It is when it is darker that light shines brighter. And I believe with all my heart that this great challenge will also bring great opportunity because the God of the Bible is a God of redemption. Redemption means that God himself is working to rescue and restore those things that sin has broken. The God of the Bible is a God of redemption. And the gospel is still good news. The church is still the salt and the light of the world. So God will call his people to have one voice and to be one people, to proclaim the one name above all names. There is no salvation in other name than the name of Jesus. And it is time for us as the, as the body of Christ to rise up and to represent the one that we call Lord and Savior. Just before Easter, we were going through the book of Revelation, chapter 1 to 3. And we were talking about how God has called Duncanville's First Baptist Church to be a church that calls all people, invites all people to join Jesus Christ in a lifelong, life-changing, and life-giving journey. This is our mission. We exist to glorify God by multiplying disciple-makers. And those disciple-makers have to be invited to come on the journey. And how are we going to do this? Well, what, we, what I was proposing is that when Jesus comes to the churches in the first century, at the end of the first century, Jesus talks to the church and tells them that it is time to walk what he has told them to live, to walk in the pathway of disciple making. Every one of the churches, seven churches of revelations, represents ways in which the church has to grow to be able to accomplish the mission that Jesus has given us, making disciple makers. Well, it just so happens that after COVID-19 and all this that has happened, the message for our church today couldn't be more timely. The message for the church in Philadelphia is the message of a God who turns the greatest challenges into open doors of opportunity. If we want to know how is it that this God will turn the challenge of this generation into the greatest opportunity that will define the church, I'll invite you to open your Bible today. Open your Bible with me in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 13. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 13. And I want you to see how Jesus can turn this desperate crisis into an open door of opportunity for his people. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 13. I'll invite you to read it with me. It says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have, you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them to come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on earth. 
I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Great opportunity doesn't come just as opportunity. It also comes with great challenge. And in times of great opportunity, Jesus brings two significant challenges in this letter to the church, even the church now. Great opportunity brings challenge. And in these verses that we just read, Jesus challenges the church to rise up to its fundamental and most essential commitments. But the first thing that Jesus wants the church to know is that whenever there is hardship, whenever there is trial, God has opportunity. Because God wants the church to know that we have to prepare for the coming harvest. You see, in times of great opportunity, Jesus wants the church to know that there is a harvest that is coming. Right here on the first verses, I want you to notice how Jesus lifts up the church to see that he is calling people to come to himself. Right at the end of these verses, you can see the, be the beautiful picture of God dwelling in the midst of his people. The God of the Bible is a God who is looking for those who have gone astray. And I, I, in, in, this, in this age of social distancing, in this age where we have to be trapped in our houses, in this age where our freedoms have been reduced to waiting, I want you to see that there is a God who has a plan to give us a place to dwell with him in safety. Right there in the final verses uh, to the Church of Philadelphia, he says in verse 12, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. For those of us who have been trapped in our houses, we may not be in a place trapped that we cannot get out. But for the churches that Jesus was writing, cities were a symbol of security. Cities and walls and safe places were a place where people could dwell and have everything they needed without a threat. And what Jesus is telling the church is that it doesn't matter if buildings are closed. It doesn't matter if people are passing uh, trials or hardship. God is there and God cares. And God will make sure that his people dwell with him. But how do we prepare for that? Well, this is a time for us to realize that the church is not buildings. The church is not programs. The church is not places. The church is the people beyond the walls that God is calling to be a people of his own, people that bear his name, people that have been chosen to dwell with him forever. How do we prepare to be the church that God wants us to be? You see, after this pandemic is over, the church has a choice of becoming one of two things. The church can become a comfortable place where people just manage a slow decline, kind of like a nursing home. You go there so, so that people can take care of you, and that's the end. Or we can become more of a nursery. We can become a place where new life, where new people come to, to be born again and to experience the blessedness of the presence of God and the hope of being followers of Jesus Christ. Which one will we be? Will we be a nursing home where people die slowly? Or will we be a nursery anticipating new life? There are several things that you have to know, and there are at least three things in this passage that you have to know as you prepare for an abundant harvest. The first one is right there in the introduction of Jesus to the church. Notice the name of the city first. Uh, what, what was Philadelphia and what was this church? Well, Philadelphia was a city in, right there in, 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 the seven, in the circuit of the seven cities right there that John is addressing. And it was called the Gateway of the East because it was a, it was a Roman city. It was a Greek culture city, but it was right there in a route directly uh, as, a gate, as a gateway to, to the, the, the other cultures in, in Middle Eastern 
and Middle Eastern culture. So it was right there as a gateway of opportunity and trade and different things, but it was also a, a gateway to many pagan religions. People had many idols, people had a, a, a very uh, a syncretistic worldview. And, and the city was built in honor of one of the kings, uh, Philadelphus, and, and, and his name meant the city of brotherly love. So this, this city was built in honor of a pagan king, but, but right there in this place, God places a small church, the Church of Philadelphia, to really be a symbol of what the gospel can do, transforming the life of people in brotherly love. How interesting that God talks to this church, and it is one of only two churches that doesn't receive any rebuke, but just commendation of what God wants to do. You see, Jesus said in the Gospel of John that people would know that they are his disciples if they love one another. Love for God, brotherly love for each other, and love for the world that God wants to reach is what defines the church of Jesus Christ. But our love has a foundation, and that foundation is the person of Jesus Christ. To prepare for the coming harvest, the church has to be able to recognize the one that is sovereign over every affliction and over every trial, and that one is our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at what it says in verse seven. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of the Holy One, the true one. There will be no harvest if we are not able to articulate with conviction the message of him who is the Holy One, the True One. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only one that will lead us to the Father. There is no competition. And we as a church, this is a time where we have to get rid of any idols and any comp competing priorities in our lives because he is the one and true God. You see, as churches, we need to recognize that Jesus is sufficient and he is sovereign. This health crisis is not beyond our Lord's control. He has been for generations walking his people through thin and thick, reminding them what Jesus said in the Great Commission. Jesus said to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to keep everything he's commanded because he's going to be with us always to the end of time. So Jesus is addressing this church and is telling the church, look, you need to remember who I am. You need to pay attention and fix your eyes on who I am. He is the Holy One, which means that he is God himself. In the Old Testament, whenever this title is used as the Holy One of Israel, it refer, refers to the God of creation, the one true God. Jesus is the one true God that has come to meet us in the flesh and to rescue us to be his. He says, he is the Holy One, the true one. He who has the key of David, who opens and no, will, no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. You see, this picture comes from the Old Testament. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 22, verse 15 to 25, there's a picture of an unfaithful steward. This steward was taking advantage of the resources of the temple to make a, to make a fortune for himself and a place for himself. And God came and said, I'm going to throw you away from my house, and I'm going to give your position to a faithful steward, another man. And God said he would give him the key of David. Keys in the Bible are symbols of authority, of power, of the right to act. You want to know who hold the, holds the keys? You want to know who's in charge of God's future? You want to know who is the one who is the head of the church? That one is Jesus Christ. You see, for a long time, people have used religion to control the masses of people. People have used churches, people have used uh, religiosity as a source of gain. But when Jesus Christ showed up, he called human beings to repentance and to a relationship with the living God, not to play religion, not to simply have a systems of thought and belief. This is the time when we have to have an encounter with the living God. And Jesus is coming to tell every church that this time of testing is a time for us to realize that actually he is in charge. 
and that we have to give an account to him. So we'd better be ready to depend on him. We have to come back to the sovereignty and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ for us. You see, it's not about buildings. It's not about programs. It's about the one name and the one person that matters most, Jesus Christ. So here's what is happening right now. Jesus is going to tell the church in Philadelphia, even in the midst of difficult situations, even in the midst of persecution of the Roman Empire, even in a COVID-19 situation, Jesus is still in charge. And because Jesus is in charge, he is the one that will open doors of opportunity if we focus on our God-given strengths. Look at what he says right there. He is the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I entitled this, this message, Big Door, Doors for Little Churches. Because this church right here was a church that wasn't anything outstanding. It wasn't particularly strong, particularly powerful, particularly attractive. Because you see, what defines the church of Jesus Christ is not the capacity to entertain people, but the capacity to point people to the one true living God, Jesus Christ. What God wants from his church is not that we are the most polished ones, the best in the way we look, the best singers, the best preachers. God wants us to be faithful, to proclaim his gospel. So Jesus says right here, I know you have but little power. And by the way, that's a commendation. That's not a rebuke. We may have but little power, but that's all it takes for God to work his wonders. God is a God who can use ordinary things to accomplish extraordinary results. And all that he takes is a little bit of faith. Jesus talked to his disciples many times and and called them ye of little faith. You see, a little faith is better than no faith. So God is talking to this church. Jesus is talking to this church and says, you have but little power. But Jesus will show the world what little power in his hands can do. Jesus is able to multiply a few fish and a few bread and feed thousands of people. Jesus is able to use very small people to bring his kingdom. So he's talking to this church and he's saying, listen, you have little power, but you have kept my word and have not denied my name. You see, when Jesus examines the health of the church, this is what Jesus is looking for. This is what the strengths of the church are all about. We got to be faithful to his word, and we have to be able to confess his name. Are you loving his word? Are you proclaiming his name? Because this is the door of opportunity that Jesus is opening in front of us. Yes, our buildings may be closed right now. Yes, we cannot gather physically, but we have networks of people thanks to technology. We have people in our Facebook pages. We have people in our YouTube channels. We have people in our Instagrams. In our every app that we have, in the palm of our hands, we have a gateway to the world. You may have contacts on the other side of the world, but the question is, have you told them about the one you follow? You see, Jesus has opened a door of opportunity, and churches that walk through it will never be the same. So the FBC family, what's it going to be for us? I keep hearing all the time, I cannot wait until we go back to normal. Let me just tell you, normal after this pandemic is not going to be the same normal. It's going to take a while to realize what normal will be. But as people are disoriented, as people are, are losing their jobs, facing medical emergencies, the church of Jesus Christ has an opportunity to tell them of the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The one who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The one who is the holy one. The one who holds the keys to our eternal destiny. And this is the door that Jesus has opened to the church. But to do that, we have to focus on our strength. Our strength is not our money, it's not our buildings, it's not our programs, it's the message of the word of God, it's the name of Jesus proclaiming the gospel. So we got this time to recalibrate and focus on our strengths, but not only that, 
There is a promise in this, in this passage also. Look at what he says to the church of Philadelphia, verse 9. Behold, I will make those, the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Again, this idea of coming before the people of God and recognizing the love of God is one of the promises of the prophets in Isaiah chapter 45, chapter 49, verse 23, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 11. The prophet has a vision of the nations coming to recognize before the people of Israel that indeed God has come to save them, that salvation comes through his people. Ironically, Jesus is saying right here that those who should have recognized his love, ironically, are now on the enemy's side. You see, here's the mystery. Jesus came to his own. The Gospel of John chapter 1 says, He came to his own, but his own rejected him. But to those who received him, received Jesus, to those who believe in his name, he gave them the power to become children of God. Let me read you a verse that captures the mystery of salvation. In Acts chapter 26, verse 18, the apostle Paul was called as, a, as an apostle to the Gentiles, but also with a message of salvation to his people, the people of Israel. Paul was a Jew. And, and chapter 26, I want you to hear what Jesus tells him he has to do. Verse 16, he says, But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. Now listen, verse 18. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. What is Jesus talking about when he says that the Jews are going to come and bow down at the church's feet? I'll tell you what I think he's saying, which is consistent with the promises of the prophets. Jesus has said that in the last days, there would be a revival of people coming back to him. There will be a harvest, even among the hardest groups of people that previously had turned their backs to him. There will be a harvest of people. This is what the open door is all about. There will be a revival of those who recognize the love of God and turn to him. Church family, people are managing right now, but things are about to get tougher. When people finally recognize their need, when people finally realize that neither our economy, nor our government, nor our health system are enough, when we finally recognize our need, people need to know that they can turn to God. And we as the people of God need to be ready to proclaim the wonders of He who called us out of darkness into His wonderful life. This is the door of opportunity. When the hardest people finally realize their, their need, we'd better be ready to proclaim the love of God. So church family, in times of opportunity, Jesus tells us, be ready for the harvest. But not only that, not only that, there's one more challenge. You see, as God shatters the strongholds of the enemy, as Jesus loosened up the grip of Satan on people's hearts and unbelief, as people softened to the message of the gospel, we, the people of God, need to be ready for the second challenge. And here it is. Our second challenge is that as the people of God, we need to affirm our essential commitments. We need to know what the fluff is and what matters most really is. Look at what Jesus says right here. Verse 9. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about the, whole, about the patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on earth. I am coming soon. Now listen. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Do you hear that? Hold fast what you have. This was a good church. It had little strength. It was little, but it was strong. And Jesus says, I'm going to use you. 
but be careful. Do not be distracted from the all-sufficient one, the holy one, the true one, the one that has the keys. Hold fast. What does hold fast mean? This word means to affirm our commitments, to really stay strong in the fundamentals and essentials of our faith. Affirm your commitments. Because you see, here's what will happen. The king will return. But if we get distracted, if we slumber, if we get discouraged, if we grow complacent, if we become callous and indifferent, it may be that we miss our opportunity to get, take advantage of this huge open door and we just receive the challenge, but don't walk through it. You see, Jesus says that there is a possibility that as we get distracted, somebody will take our crown. This is a time to stay strong because here's what's going to happen. The king will come back. We are living in the last days. Ever since Jesus came, these are the last days. These are the last days because these are the days when God is proclaiming that he will restore anybody, that he will forgive any sin, that he will restore the kingdom to his people. The new creation ever since resurrection has already started. The children of the kingdom is what God is calling now. We are living the last, the last days. But when this time of grace is over, King Jesus will return. And when he returns, grace will be over and judgment will come. He will come back to judge the living and the, and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. But this is a time of grace. This is a time where Jesus is welcoming everybody to be part of his kingdom, to have eternal security, to receive eternal life. And it is all free. If we get distracted from that, then we may lose our crown. This is a time to stay strong until the king returns. Now, there's a promise right there. He says, because you have kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from the hour of trial that will come upon the whole world. You see, if you're a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, this is not going to be an easy ride. This is going to be a bumpy one. There will be difficulties. But in every difficulty, God, promise, God promises that he will be there to help us. He will be there, and we are safe in his hands. Jesus said to his disciples that not even a hair from our head would perish. But you see, we have a risk, or we have a danger. Jesus gave a parable to his disciples one time. He said, you see, it is like, like the parable of a wedding. Ten virgins have to wait for the, the groom to come. And they're waiting in the middle of the night, and it gets longer on the waiting. So some of them don't prepare adequately. They don't have enough oil for their lamps and their lamps grow dark. And only a few of them that were prudent, that were prepared, were ready when the groom came because the other ones were sleepy. And they were the ones that came through the gate into the wedding. The other ones were left behind and were left out. You and I have the great risk of being distracted from the essentials of our faith. And what distracts us? Let me just tell you a few things. You and I can lose hope. If you forget who is in charge, the negativity of the media, all the difficulties, all the pressures and the needs around us can get so hard that we, we grow worried, we grow fearful, and we grow discouraged. Don't let the tensions of the present take away your joy of your hope. Stay hopeful. You could also become complacent. Maybe you have some savings and you're relying on your money. Maybe you're comfortable thinking things are going to go back to normal very soon. This is a time when you and I are going to have to get out of our comfort zone. You cannot be complacent. This is a time for you to pray and to watch and to get ready to engage with the message of Jesus Christ. Before COVID-19, you could be comfortable just going to church, having Sunday school, listening to sermons right now. The worst thing you can do is just to become a consumer of religious good, going from sermon to sermon, going from service to service online. This is not a time just for you to eat and consume religious goods. This is a time for you to share with the world the message of Jesus Christ. So church family, we're going to have to be lean and mean. We're going to have to be a congregation that is not just receiving things, but now has to be ready to get out of our comfort zone and share with the world. Another thing that could happen is that you can grow indifferent. You can just shelter in place in your own house, ignore, ignore the world, and let difficulty passing you by. But you, if you do that, you're going to be alone. 
and you're going to miss the chance to see revival sweeping in the church. Because at the end of the day, this is the promise Jesus said. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This evening, I'm here alone in the building preaching to an empty building with a few people in the crew recording. But let me tell you this. This is not how heaven will be. This is not how this temple Jesus is talking will be. His presence will be filled with joy, will be filled with people. And this is the time where our empty building deploys our people wherever we are to be the church beyond these walls. Yeah, it is true. COVID-19 has closed our church buildings, but God is using this crisis so that we can understand that the church is not the buildings, but his people beyond the walls with one message about the Holy One, the true one, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, who shuts and no one opens. But this door is a big door for any little church that proclaims his name. Let's be that church. Pray with me. As you're right there in your place, I want to ask you two questions. Two questions that reflect the challenge of Jesus. So here's your first question. Are you ready for the harvest? Are you ready to faithfully confess his name? Are you ready to treasure his word in your life? Are you ready to make your life a billboard for Jesus? Get ready for the harvest because if you have never won a person for Jesus Christ, this may be your opportunity. Start praying. Pray and proclaim his word. Through your Facebook, through your Instagram. Not, I'm not telling you to simply invite people to church. It's not about inviting people into buildings anymore. It's about inviting people into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about inviting people to join Jesus Christ in a lifelong, life-changing, and life-giving journey. Are you ready for the harvest? The second thing, are you firm in your commitment? Are you ready to call yourself by his name? Here's my challenge. You gotta be the real deal. COVID-19 will reveal those who are and those who are not of his. Be the real deal. Father, thank you. Thank you for knowing that even though we're living in challenging times, because of your son, Jesus Christ, you can turn every challenge into a door of opportunity. May we be the church. May we be the church that although we have little strength, we give you that strength so that you can bring an abundant harvest for your glory, for people's joys. Lord, we want people to be in your presence forever. We want people, when the kingdom comes, to be called by your name because you used us to tell them of your great love. We want people, Lord, to come and bow before you, recognizing your love. So, Lord, we pray for Duncanville's First Baptist Church to be a church that joins in the harvest and that is firm in our commitment to lifting up the one who is the life, the truth, and the way, your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray.